weekend as usual. <laughs> uh, you know what? Today is going to be an absolutely amazing show. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard me say before um, a key phrase when it comes to data. And I learned that key phrase from this gentleman. I'm going to bring him in right now. Um, so Dean Crook. Dean, I, I'm telling you right now, when I first met you at the TCA Bridging Borders Carrier event last year, um, the key phrase that you said to me that put so much into perspective, because I, for the last probably seven or eight years, I've been on this journey of how can I learn more to help do more, be more, and achieve more for my clients. Mm -hmm. And the key phrase that you said was data is the new oil. Mm -hmm. And I can still remember, I was sitting with a colleague of mine, Michael Scalzo at the table, and I just went, Wow, I actually still have the video on my phone. Um, you know, I got to ask, because just so I'm not the only one saying it, so it can come from a gentleman with your stature, with your knowledge, your credibility in the industry. How important is data in today's market? Uh, I think, I don't know how you could survive without data. It's uh, on a scale of, you know, zero to 10, it's a 10 in my world. Uh, without data, you have very little context. Not only can't you sort of shoot with a laser, uh, you know, it, it's kind of the analogy of, you know, using a, a uh, you know, a broad brushed approach versus using a laser to zero in on uh, what's really going on. Because a lot of us that have been in transport and sales, I guess, for a long time, we use a lot of our experience. And some of that experiential learning is based on how we observe the world, which can be biased. Uh, you know, I have my own biases um, as I look at the transport world in particular based on where I was brought up, um, how what sort of things I did in my career, how I was treated, the culture where I work. The reality is that that could be completely biased when you go into another operation, and uh, you could you could actually be misleading people. I've got some great examples of how data can be completely misconstrued, but on, on the positive side, used to actually zero in on what causes things like truck accidents, what causes rates to move. Um, so to me, it's it's the most important thing in today's society because without it, um, you're really, you know, you're, you're blind in terms of what's really going on around you. Welcome to the HPLS podcast. Live, relevant and high performance information, conversations and education weekly. Well, you know, Dean, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and that's why I'm so, well, for starters, I'm so honored that you're going to join us on December 11th at the High Performance Logistics Sales Summit. Because, and not only that, I'm overly honored that you're going to join me today because sharing with salespeople, you know, that connection between data, transparency, you know, when a rock hits a pond somewhere, mm -hmm. what happens? to the shore when it comes to data right. and how we can achieve long-term client fulfillment, long-term goal achievement for our clients and really retain clients long-term, I think goes hand in hand. And I know when we were talking off air, we're going to talk data. I'm going to relate it back to sales. We're going to talk data. I'm going to relate it back to sales. Okay. Um, you know, the first things first, obviously, if anyone's dealing in LA at this time, share with us um, if you can, I'd actually, if you don't mind, I'd like to go back to our conversation we had about five weeks ago when we were talking about what's going to happen now in LA and then let's bring it back to today as to what's actually happening. So can we yeah. do that for a second? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, if you sort of put everything into context, we've been uh, connected at the hip, uh, like it or not, with China in particular. It's been the world's manufacturing powerhouse for about 20 years and as consumers in North America we've become very much accustomed to buying uh, you know fast moving consumable goods whether it be the clock behind you the TV monitor you're using my computer monitor a lot of those things come from uh, Southeast Asia in particular and uh, you know as a result of global trade we've become uh, you know the economy is very flat in terms of trade so we've got lots of uh, you know, vessels moving freight all around the world at fairly high rates of speed these days. These massive vessels are carrying 20,000 containers at a clip. 
And, and what we've seen, um, you know, sort of bringing that back down to the pandemic, what we've seen is a whole shift in how consumers purchase goods. We've seen the channels shift, as in they've moved more to online purchasing of goods. And, and not only have they changed the way they purchase, they've actually changed what they're buying. If you looked at the last GDP numbers that came out for the end of Q3, uh, spending on services you know, travel, education, financial planning, things like that were down about 6% compared to the quarter last year. But consumption or spending on goods, the goods part of GDP, was up 6%. So that it's significant because when people aren't travelling more, uh, what they did is they spent more on physical goods that, that trucks carry. So that shift ended up with more freight being hauled by truck operators in the last year. But backing back to the import analogy, what that meant was a higher volume of goods coming from overseas to replenish the inventories that were drawn down during the pandemic in April. So what we've seen, uh, Dan, since uh, we spoke last was this uh, massive influx of imported freight that kind of peaked in late October. And then uh, what we saw, and it was record level volumes of imports. And what was driving that was the fear of uh, retailers and shippers that they would run out of uh, inventory again. So they were really trying to avoid the inventory failures they saw during March and April when we were all restocking our pantries. And, and that fear drove this massive surge of imports from Asia and it hit the West Coast, it hit Seattle, Portland, uh, right down to, to Oakland, Los Angeles, Long Beach, Houston, Savannah, Wilmington, Baltimore. All of those ports had higher volumes of imports. The most, though, were concentrated on the Los Angeles, Long Beach area because that's the closest uh, and the biggest port, although there's lots of congestion there now. Um, so what happened was we had this huge volume of freight come in. And, uh, you know, even right now, I looked on marine traffic last night, there are 15 cargo vessels sitting at anchor trying to find a berth at Long Beach and Los Angeles to unload their containers. And, and what we're seeing is that, uh, that people, you know, retailers, shippers are pulling forward as much inventory for next spring. They're pulling it forward now because they realise that capacity on the ocean is tight. It's hard to get a slot for a container. And there's actually a shortage of empty containers back in Asia to reload to come back to the United States. So if you, you know, I know I'm sort of going around a few topics here, but what that means for the trucking industry and trying to understand why are rates at three dollars thirty a mile and why are they up, why have rates tripled out of Los Angeles in the last two hundred days? It's because as consumers, we are buying more and more fast-moving consumable goods online, which means that the supply chains have to bring that in much faster. It comes in through Los Angeles, it goes on a train or a truck, it heads inland. Uh, so if you, you know, volumes peaked in Los Angeles at the end of October when all the containers hit, and then that moves across the country like a tidal wave of containers. Uh, Memphis is the next big logistics hub in the United States. That's a massive freight hub. You've got all the class one railroads hub there, two big interstates. And so volumes this week, so volumes were down in the last two weeks in Los Angeles after being up 50% month over month in October. In, in that, so that wave moved across the country this week. And in Memphis this week, volumes were up about 8% because that volume had moved across the country. And then truckload volumes start to move out from Memphis, Columbus, Lexington, Kentucky, where all the warehouses are that are moving this freight to uh, other warehouses for you and I to order online so it's here the next day. So what yeah. I would describe is a supply chain that started probably three months ago with an order that's ended up here now. And, and of course, what they're doing is we're seeing Black Friday sales over the period of six weeks, not just the day after Thanksgiving. So what, what retailers have tried to do is flatten out the peak in retail shopping. So if you weren't connecting the dots and following the data, what you would have missed is the peak shipping season has already occurred because it normally happens around now for trucking. Right now, yeah. Mm -hmm. right? Well, I've been writing about that for months thinking that it looks like all of this volume has already come in and it's in warehouses. And that's, that's kind of what it looks like now because volumes are starting to fall off again. And that's, that's important because if you're a carrier 
and you're wondering about, are rates going to stay at 3.30 a mile? Uh, mm. I would say to you today that probably not because they've already been tailing off in the last few weeks. They're starting to come off as the volumes start to decline on the West Coast. But if I go further inland to those high volume markets, um, you're seeing rates going up because there's more freight moving inland now to where the big population centres are. You know, and, and, and I love that. And I think that's the starting point of all great achievements when it comes to sales, because, you know, part of what I wanted to talk about today was the mitigation of client negative client exposure and kind of how you and I went offline a bit. Um, you know that negative client exposure is is mitigating the rates increasing mitigating some of this stuff staying ahead of the curve you know to as much as possible but that from what you're getting at where i'm going and correct me if i'm wrong if you have clients in that memphis area you should be preparing them for right. rates going up right right, right. so okay. your data and, and and we'll get back to another key part of it that you said in there where, where you know four percent increase in ships hitting a, a port mm -hmm. equals x over the road because mm -hmm. one another key point that you shared at the tca event was 92 percent mm -hmm. of all the freight we haul on trucks has touched a ship yeah. is that still about right the number yeah. or is that changed to a higher number no, it's still about that it's probably more so on certain items though like you know during the pandemic there's been record sales of tvs and vacuum cleaners and yes. record, record sales <laughs> of pressure That's pressure. Funny, isn't it no. <laughs> Uh, it's like so now now there's a shortage of outdoor heaters for restaurants uh yes there was a massive shortage of uh pressure treated lumber because yes. during the pandemic we were outside building decks so you know freight rates for carriers hauling lumber they were up about 20 cents a mile compared to all other building materials because there was a shortage of pressure treated lumber uh, i just looked at the data today um uh, new home starts and about 60% of single family homes are built in the southeast of the United States. They're up 30% year over year. So, uh, so you uh, think of how much product goes into building a home. Right. Then you work that backwards from yeah. a freight perspective. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I don't, I, and it blows, like data is, data is the new oil. Yeah. That, if you have data yeah. and you can protect your customer to the best of your ability, at least be ahead of the curve. Right. You know, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example is, um, I do a lot of auditing and a lot of kind of analytical work for companies that move freight or that import export, mm -hmm. um, as well as sales coaching. And one of the companies I was working with um, said, said, okay, we need to figure something out because my ocean freight is, it's not consistent. Um, I feel like there's so many inconsistencies. I'm sick of it. I need someone consistent. And it's funny because prior to understanding the importance of data, I would have said, well, I'm consistent all the time. No problem. And I said, okay, well, what do you mean by consistent? He says, well, we're being bumped at yeah. ports. And I said, well, from where? They said Asia. And I went, okay, understanding and making sure I do an hour of education every day on our industry to understand what it is. I've got a list of 12 different publications I go to, including that, where I read articles, I kind of skim through and, and find ones that pique my interest. I keep a little database of them to send to customers and kind of forewarn customers, hey, FYI, this is happening. Um, I realized that it might not be as forwarder. That's the issue. And so I started make, call, making a few calls and I realized that with the iPhone 12 launch, the Xbox S, uh, PS5 and Amazon, so many people are being bumped from ships because it's just, right. Right. you know, whatever the circumstances in the background, mm -hmm. they're being bumped. So I actually called the customer back and I said, and, and I'm going to get to the point of this for all you salespeople out there. I actually called the customer back and I said, listen, this isn't your broker that's inconsistent. Do I hope I won't be bumped from the ship? Of right. course. Right. But I can't tell you I won't get bumped with right. any certainty. Right. And before we start doing business, I want you to understand that it may be inconsistency in their reporting to you and them telling you when things are arriving, that's different. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to a port where I have no physical control, right. I can't crack a whip mm -hmm. and somebody load your container over Apple's container or whatever the case may be. Right. Um, you know, that customer came back and said, you know, Dan, I really appreciate that. Right. I'm going to give you the business just right. because you seem to know more about what's happening right. than the person I'm using. And I want that person 
that's at the top of their game. So for yeah. all you salespeople out there, yeah. take notes on this. This yeah. is important. You know, we go back to that four or five percent. That four or five percent increase. So we're talking, you know, you were talking fifteen vessels are still sitting off in, yeah. in anchor off of Long Beach. Yeah. How many containers on average are at that are on each of those vessels? And what would a four percent increase or decrease mean from a vessel count? Right. Uh, it's 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 a good question. Um, I'm going to say they're probably in the twelve to thirteen thousand TEU range. Um, so, <laughs> if, like, and of course, to your point, you, you've been your best containers being bumped for high priority containers. You know, like PPE goods, uh, things that have yep. a higher value that have a shorter lead time. So, uh, it's and it's the other thing down there from a capacity point of view. To your example, a lot of the ocean lines have been uh, blanking their sailings and constraining capacity. So they've exercised really good capacity management that I think large trucklet carriers seem to be doing this year. They're not adding as more trucks because they're uncertain mm -hmm. about demand and the mm -hmm. ocean lines literally parked big ships. And of course it tightened mm -hmm. capacity immediately and rates went from 2,300 for a 40 footer up to about 3,800 where they've been for about 10 weeks now. So capacity is really tight, not because there's more demand necessarily, it's because they've parked a lot of ships. So yeah. you've got yeah. to give your, your customers context and that's, that's the business intelligence part of data, which is the context. You can never sugarcoat a bit of pill. And that's why, you know, giving customers the news, uh, good, bad or indifferent, is absolutely critical because data on its own doesn't really tell you a lot unless it's in the context of what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, so let's put that into context. I, I think a lot of asset-based carriers learned a big lesson from the 2018-19 shift, Yeah. right? 2018, you know, just to go back to what you said, a lot of carriers aren't buying equipment because they're saying, well, we're not sure what's going to happen. Right. I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, my perception on it is 2018 taught a lot of people a very expensive lesson, right? Mm -hmm. Rates started climbing. No, I mean, capacity was at an all time. I've never, in 27 years, I've never seen capacity that low. Um, shippers start looking at better ways to move their goods. How can we change, shift and pivot with the times to move my goods at a lesser cost, but still mm -hmm. complete my supply chain. At the same time, they're doing that, reducing overall orders or loads, I guess, if you want to say, carriers are buying trailers at an all-time high rate, right. creates a perfect storm for 2019, rates drop below 2005 levels. Right. Rates drop below 2005 levels, right. you've just purchased a bunch of equipment, <laughs> you have a huge amount of new overhead, right. and you're getting paid dirt. Yep. Um, we've never, in, in kind of what I've done, and I'd love to know if you have data on this, is, I'm figuring about 92 to 96 percent of the RFPs that went out in 2018 were not adhered to in 2019. I mean, just from and that's just my own personal perspective moving forward. And the people I've spoken to, you know, we had awards of seven RFPs, and in 2019 they all went to spot market. Right. We didn't get any freight, right? Because it was just right. this yeah. huge shift. Yeah. I mean, I, I've I've said to a few people now, and and it's a big thing for me is. Like if we look at the last 36 months in our industry, the roller coaster ride, and I'm not, right. Dean, I'm not saying anyone else isn't having a roller coaster ride, right. but holy doodle, my friend. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I'm, I mean, I'm looking at go, I've never seen shifts so ebb and flow in right. my life in this industry. I think probably the biggest one was when the US dollar went from like that dollar fifty six to the dollar ten and dollar twenty right. and things were just crazy. I mean, literally I remember being at the logistics company I was at and the number was changing so rapidly when you had US clients, your your business numbers would just like the the chain it was crazy how it was so unstable. Uh, but other than that, I mean it, I, I, am I accurate with that perspective or am I completely off? Absolutely. You know, we've seen, um, I was reading a McKinsey report a little while ago where they said that they've seen uh, the digital transformation that we've all been through, which gets to the RFP process because we've had a massive amount of digital transformation of the way we share data between shippers and carriers. It, mm -hmm. The McKinsey report said that they've seen five years worth of digital transformation in the last five months. And I, really? I would bet that we've had as much disruption in the trucking industry in the last five months. I, I, I did a post on LinkedIn last night about the correlation between load to truck ratio and spot rates. 
And I, I made a comment that we, you know, the, the truck industry has been completely transformed this year, where you know truck contract volumes are down about ten percent year over year. Mm -hmm. Spot market rates are up, spot market volumes up one hundred and twenty percent year over year. So when you when when you know, uh, fifteen percent of the volume that moves on spot moves up one hundred and twenty percent year over year. There's something very different happening if overall volumes are down, and it's got to do with this freight market imbalance. It's why um, you know, uh, turkey production and sweet potato production in North Carolina, the number one state for both, is off the charts this week. It's it's like the week before Thanksgiving. Everybody's scrambling to find refrigerated trailers uh, for those two things. It's the same in Twin Falls, Idaho. Uh, Christmas trees are coming out of that part of the country now. The live ones, mm -hmm. refrigerated trailers. So if you if you sort of if you look at how this market is behaving, even though volumes are down overall, there are pockets that if you weren't looking for them, you'd miss them. And that gets to back to data because I'm a big believer that you have this sort of bell curve distribution, but no one's really home at the average, right? It's yes. The, I think it's the outliers where the actual margins of opportunity are where you can really find customers that, that really need a solution where there could be a premium that's paid for it that's fair for both parties. And that's why when you look at the freight market, you look at Los Angeles because of the example we gave you, uh, Twin Falls, Idaho is the number one market this week for load posts on our load board. It's because of apples, pears, onions, potatoes and Christmas trees, right? So you've got to, you've got to look at what's happening in the market now and it's the context that allows you to have that discussion with your customers, I think, that says that, you know, here's, the, here's what's happening in the overall market, but here's what's mm -hmm. happening in your market today, and here's what I think we need to do about it. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, let, if we take that back, not only from a sales, but an operations perspective, right. you know, we as salespeople, we're, we're trying to get business from a customer that's, say, in Idaho right now. Right. Um, all of a sudden, over the last couple of days, they're like, hey, do you have availability for here? And it's funny because, <laughs> and I know a lot do this, so if you're a, an actual shipper on this, don't take offense to this, but it's, here's your opportunity to get something done because there's no trucks in the area. So you got to kind of pull what the, you know, the proverbial rabbit out of your hat, if you will. Um, but it, as an operations person, if you don't understand that, or as a salesperson, if you don't understand the market as a whole or self-educate yourself yeah um yeah. you could you could waste a lot of time yeah energy effort and resources which in right. turn is money yeah. yeah on almost a losing battle right, right. because if the customer's saying well you, you know like as we know happens well i i pay you know a thousand bucks for this right okay you know mr customer um I appreciate that. And in a normal environment, there's a thousand dollars. However, right. because of X, A, B, C, D, E, F, G right. in Idaho, your refrigerated trailers are a mint. Right. So are you willing to throw an extra thousand dollars in to make that happen? I'm going to try and get it for the, as close to the price as right. you, you need it for. Right. But if you're not willing to put it in, yeah. I mean, we're just wasting each other's time. You may as well go on to the next person that's going to try and do it for you or the next person that's going to lie to you and say they can do it. Yeah. Now, that to me as a salesperson right. um, positions me as the knowledgeable salesperson that understands the market and I can immediately share with the customer that expectation, I guess, for lack of a better word, is right. unrealistic, right? And yeah. that to me is the gold in data. It is. And, and to use this analogy uh, around Twin Falls, um, you know, so again, data is very powerful because produce volumes, according to the USDA, they're down about 8,000 truckloads a week compared to the same week last year. Mm -hmm. About 8,000 truckloads nationally. But because of the pandemic, you and I are buying more frozen food from the cold store aisle in the supermarket because we want to A, make fewer trips to the store, and B, we want food that's longer shelf life. So if you're a refrigerated carrier, volumes could be down on the fresh produce side but up on the frozen side. And in mm -hmm. a market, you've got very different people. I mean, in Twin Falls, Idaho, you've got lots of produce right up through the Yakima Valley and around Pendleton, um, but you've also got the world's largest yogurt factory. And, and there's, there's so much within a market that you've got to understand about where capacity and price sits uh, because the pandemic has completely upset everything because the whole food services industry has been decimated, fresh volumes are down. But the volume of freight to haul 
the same item to a supermarket is very different than a terminal market like like Hunts Point in Brooklyn because it takes more packaging to deliver that product to an online uh, e-commerce solution than it does to a fresh produce market. It, yeah. it requires more freight. It's more loads. It's a whole, a whole different supply chain. So data is absolutely critical to understanding what's going on in our market right now. And uh, there's just so many examples. Uh, but I like to, I think, Dan, the key thing for anybody that's in freight, you've got to understand what's driving demand. I say, I say to drivers all the time, don't, don't necessarily read trucking magazines, read what your customers are reading. Read shipping magazines, freight magazines, consumer magazines. Look for things that tell you about demand for the things you haul. Are people buying less or more of what you haul? And that to me is how you position yourself in a market to take advantage of all of the ebbs and flows in freight, whether it's daily, weekly or, or yearly. So can I can I can we play there for a second? Because I think you just hit on something that's so key. Yeah. So as a salesperson or operations person, um, we're we're talking. So I'm going to kind of write this down as we go. So number one is read articles and magazines of, yeah. in the industries that you haul freight. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, read what your competitors are reading. You want to know where they're getting their information. That's really important. And and then and understand everything about their industry. Like I, I, for flatbed carriers, I look all the time at new building permits, new family, new family home starts, how many homes are being built, what's the price of lumber. Uh, all those things tell me about you know, demand for flatbeds. If I've got a drop deck, um, I'm looking at import volumes of farm machinery from France into Baltimore or, you know, Komatsu's from Japan. I'm looking at volumes of wheel loaders into Houston for Caterpillar. I'm looking at all of that external data because it tells me about the probability of volumes being higher or lower at those ports for those machinery levels or, you know, volumes of lumber coming out of Portland or British Columbia. Dean, that's gold. Yeah. That is gold for any sales rep to truly understand the market. Not only that, to decide what markets they want to get into, decide a market they might want to dominate, to decide the relationships that they need to build with suppliers. If they see demand going up, start developing more relationships because the relationships you have might not sustain the volume coming down the pipe for your customer. I mean, that's gold. What would be step two? Um, I think you've got to understand what your competitors are doing. That's kind of uh, that's the most important part. I've always been a, a firm believer that if you're doing the same thing as everyone else, you're probably doing the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. and, I love that. Yes, let sir. Let me explain that. Let me explain that a bit. Um, yeah. we, we just sold our house here in, in Boston um, because of this thing called urban flight. And uh, there's so if you think about great times to sell, there's very low levels of inventory, but lots of demand for homes that you can work from home and school children at home with lots of yep. space. Well, it turns out, you know, we didn't buy this for that reason. We have three acres and lots of space and I've got a great office set up here at home. Well, it turns out demand for my property has never been higher. So yep. what we decided to do was put it on the market. Well, it sold over, over asking price within six hours to give you an idea how hot this, the home mm -hmm. market. Now, I knew that from tracking all of the freight, the flatbed volumes of building materials all over the country because urban flight has been pushing people out of cities into rural areas for new homes that are tech enabled, technology enabled, right? So, so now the flip side is there's an exodus of people moving out of the city where there are now some great bargains. So, <laughs> I like your So if you're doing the same thing as everyone else, so, so okay, this trucking going. analogy, if yeah. I'm following everybody and I'm getting my information over the CB and at truck stops, I'm probably in a market where there's too many people. I want to do the opposite of what my colleagues are doing in the freight market because that's where the opportunities are. And that's where I think data is really important because it tells you that, hey, volumes of uh, freight in, you know, um, in, in Baltimore for farm machinery are way down because that's what the – uh, Construction and Equipment Association just reported. So I'm going to maybe, uh, you know, work my drop deck in another market. I'm maybe going to work in the lumber market and reposition myself up into the Pacific Northwest where there's a huge demand for trailers for pressure-treated lumber. 
Now, mm -hmm. that would have been an example three months ago. So that's just an example of how I would think differently. If I had a refrigerated trailer, uh, I'd be in North Carolina right now, uh, without doubt, on a, on a Thursday or a Friday looking for that weekend load, lots of miles. You know, demand's going to be very high. Um, you know, if I'm running from Chicago to the Pacific Northwest, I'm thinking the everybody wants Christmas trees in their lots the, day, the weekend after Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. So if I work back from that and I think, well, next Thursday or Friday, there's going to be a lot of freight moving out of there that could probably get me home for Thanksgiving because now uh, load planners are trying to figure out they're tightening the radius around where they send their trucks so they can get their drivers home for the break. So what that means is when they tighten that radius, there's opportunity in the outliers for shippers that are looking for those longer lengths of haul. So that's that's an example of how you would look at the market differently than everyone else to find the outliers where there's good margin. Tells me you're being very strategic about the market yeah. as opposed to being a, um, for lack of a better word, like herded cattle. Everybody, right. this, this is my triangle, this is my triangle, this is what I do. Yeah. How do we stay ahead of the yeah. market curves? Right. Right. And and from an asset based perspective, how do we stay ahead of the market curves to make our trucks as profitable as possible right. to well, maintain right. supply chain, keep drivers happy, keep everybody happy, get right. people home when they need to get home? Right. Takes a bit of planning. It takes a bit of strategy right. from a sales perspective. Same. Excuse me. Same thing. How do I mitigate my client's negative exposure right. if all these trucks are going to the Pacific Northwest and I need them out of right. Florida? Right. And. Strawberries have just started their first harvest last week. Um, yeah. Still deep backhaul territory. Um, iceberg lettuce just started harvesting in Humor, Arizona last week. So volumes shift from Salinas down into the desert region. So if you're in if you're in San Diego empty today, I could guarantee you there's loads of lettuce pumping out of Humor. It's only a couple hundred miles deadhead. But just knowing just knowing that what's coming online where, whether it be dry goods, uh, you know containers of freight coming into Los Angeles or Elizabeth, New Jersey, or what's coming out of Canada uh, or Mexico. Just knowing all of that is, it helps you understand why the rate will be what it is on the day of. And what I, what I like to do is I like to put myself in a position to have the best possible discussion on that day, but it's not so much about the rate, it's about the timing. Like when am I going to be in a market and how long am I going to wait around? And do I then head into a market because there's more more volume, less capacity. So understanding all of that takes some doing. Uh, I know some larger fleets automate all of that through their, their data and technology and, and algorithms, but for a lot of smaller carriers that work in the, in the load board spot market, um, you've got to do a lot of reading and understand the context of what's around your truck, not just what you can see over the hood. Mm, that's a great analogy to put it. You know, and, and also with your kind of top three things to do, yep. Um, you, you're kind of giving the smaller carriers a roadmap right. to say, okay, like let's expand that knowledge a little bit and let, right. let's think outside the box, right. but work from reverse in. You know, I often tell sales reps a lot when I'm speaking to them, I say, you see this, this yeah. to you is just a package of markers, right. but think about the logistics behind this marker. Right. You know, think about it. Where does the tube get made? Where does the raw plastic come in? Where does the spring come in? How do they build it? What about the rubber? What about this piece of rubber? What about this inside? The tube that it has the ink, but then the ink inside the tube, then the piece that goes on. So there's, you know, 15 different companies involved from raw product to get this to your door. Exactly. Let's not think about, I just want to go and, and deal with pilot pens. Why don't we think about if pilot needs raw plastics, let's investigate the, the largest company of importing raw plastics. And let's go right, right. back to the source right. and work our way forward to be the most productive uh, salesperson we can be. Right. And then you come in, you say, okay, I, I haul a lot of plastics in. It's most likely that some of those plastics are gonna hit your company. Right. Okay, then you kind of work down the supply chain. Yep. And what I'm hearing from you, and correct me if I'm wrong, is, it's pretty much the exact same approach and reverse, you know, start with the end in mind right. and then reverse that back to what it is. And, and I, I love that. I mean, that, that to me, anyone who's watching or hears this in the re that's gold, that's game changing for your business, game changing. It's why, it's why trailer orders are so high. And it's not so much because carriers think there's gonna be excess demand next year. That's part of it for dry vans and reefers. 
based on how we're all buying different things online. It's also because production lines are having trouble getting the parts. Mm. The S cams, the brake drum, the LED light, if you go back through the whole supply chain, and it comes back to this thing, and again, I read this on, I listened to CNBC Squawk Box. So I, I listened to all these different shows because I, I want to just be a sponge for what's driving, uh, you know, what's driving demand for what I haul uh, or what our customers haul. And, and it was the CEO of Whirlpool was talking about how the how the supply, the delivery dates of dishwashers, and this was back in April, was out from two weeks to six months. Mm-hmm. So because everybody's obviously at home doing renovations, putting in more dishwashers, but the, the, the two weeks to six months delay was because he had to space out his workers in his factory more to protect them. Mm. So you got twofold. People are going through dishwashers quicker, yeah. plus they can't, can't get produced as fast because they're they're spreading their team out more. And then, of course, you, you get into, you start bumping docks, and next thing you're thinking, heck, it's taking a lot longer to get this freight in the trailer. Um, uh, and, and then it's their production volumes are affected. So your lane balance is all out of skew now because you've got different volumes on different lanes for different products. You've got surge volumes on some products on some lanes that weren't in last year's RFP. And, and we're looking at that right now. We're seeing record levels of new rates on OD pairings compared to last mm-hmm. year, which means there's a lot of new rates to new warehouses that were never built before because we're building more warehouses closer to population so you and I can get our stuff overnight. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, and it's gone to that kind of Amazon effect model that everybody's talking about, or I guess it's been the talk for a year and a half now. Right. You know, it, it's funny you say that. I had a conversation with a friend of mine who's a contractor, and I've shared this information with quite a few salespeople, and he says, you do not, uh, you would not believe the amount of septic beds we're replacing this year. Hmm. He goes like, I, 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 probably 300% more than we would normally replace. Hmm. And in, uh, cause I'm, I'm also up in the country yep. um, and we're all septic, there's no yep. sewers. Same. And you, exactly. So you think about what goes into a septic because more people are home, people are working from home. My prediction right when this happened um, I remember sitting down with my wife and I'm saying, you know what, the way homes are built is going to be different. The way the infrastructure in cities is going to be different. Corporate, co- like corporations that re- that change their mentality faster are the ones that are going to survive. You know, I know, I know logistics companies right now where they're dead set. No, everybody's coming into the office and I'm like, mm-hmm. you know, you're going to lose people and you're going to lose good people because of it. Yeah. How do we create that infrastructure? I know, I know some big corporations, some big logistics companies in the U S had to lay people off because they just didn't have the infrastructure to right. support them. Right. Some people say, you know, and, and people are probably going to hate me for this, but some people say, well, that's not fair. I say, if you can't support your sales team, you're better to let them go. Now, if they go somewhere else and take their customers, don't go after them legally. Right. But if you can't support them, they have to go make a living for their family. Right. So you're better to let them go instead of them, their business deteriorating, them losing image, credibility, and brand. You're much better to let them go. So from that perspective, I I commend their yes. decision. Right. Um, however, if they're going after these these salespeople from legal perspective because they're taking their clients, well, I'm sorry, you can't have your cake and eat it too a lot of the times. Right. But going back to that, it's okay. What's involved in a septic? Hmm. Right. What 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 is involved? If this is happening here, hmm. it's happening where you live. It's happening all over the country, all over North America, probably all over the world. Whoever uses a septic bed. So, if you're in that flatbed industry, if you haul that dirt, that perf, um, what do they call it? High performance bedding or whatever it is that goes in. If you haul the tiles, yeah, yeah. get prepared for a massive increase in that. I mean. I, I was the same way. You know, you talked about pressure treated lumber. I was the same. I, I went into, I bought a shed right. beginning of the summer and I decided at the end of the summer to put it up. <laughs> and, and and I went to Home Depot and I'm, I'm standing there and the pieces of wood that were $2 and 35 cents are now $9. Right. Right. I mean, awesome. a foundation for a simple shed right. went from like, you know, 60 bucks to 280. And I was like, this is crazy. Yeah. I should have done it at the beginning of the summer when there was a bunch of supply and zero demand because nobody had started, right? Well, it's, if you follow the if you follow the thread, the the lumber the lumber mills uh, build their inventories, so they build their inventories over winter for spring, but all of the inventories got drawn down in March. So the spring inventory for summer and spring typical home building projects 
all of that volume was gone. And because the mills are shut down because of the pandemic, there was no production. Yes. So, so yeah. it's this massive ramp up. And just on the whole issue of, of septic, you know, we live on, I live on the line of March where the uh, Minutemen went to fight the British in the 1700s, right? So that's how old our area is. But okay. we sold our house, we had to get a Title V inspection. It took six weeks for the company to come and do the septic because they were so, I was going to say backed up. That's probably the wrong word to use, but they were... <laughs> They were they were so they had such a backlog of inspections because they were having trouble meeting the demand. And to that point, they could they couldn't put enough triaxial septic trucks on the road to meet demand at the moment. They they are building out their capacity in their fleet. So it's another area of the business I would never have thought of. And I've got you know the flip side is all the friends I've got in Boston that haul dump trailers. The pandemic is shutting down construction sites every time there's a case. So I've got friends that have parked their dump trailer and now they're under flatbeds and reefers hauling final mile freight. So there's this capacity migration going on too because of the way the pandemic has impacted. And all that, you can see all that through the data when you look at, there's a great company called Homebase that's time and attendance software. And when you track the number of hours working, people employed, locations open, what you see is that since about July, we were only we were we were about twenty percent down on hours worked, employees working, and locations open compared to pre-pandemic. And you can look at it by state. And again, this is really important data because if you if you're thinking about where is the pandemic impacting a state and why is production down? Because when the pandemic is sort of hitting an area, consumption goes up, production goes down because we're not working and we're at home. So that affects your lane balance on your on your truckload side. You've got less. You've got more going in, less coming out, and and so if you look at home based data, and again time and attendance material, anybody can look at it. It tells you at a state level where the state is based on how many locations are back open compared to the pandemic. And it's just another data point. It's you know no one data point on its own is conclusive. But I look at data like a jigsaw puzzle. You know, yep. you get the complete picture when you put it all together, and that's how I look at different parts of the freight market to come up with a picture albeit that picture's changing quite gradually, uh, quite quickly compared to gradually in the past. You know, it's, um, sorry, I thought you were gonna continue there. Um, Good. It's, um, it, it's, it, and this is one of the things that I consistently say daily. Right. Daily, daily, daily. You know, that one article, that one consumer report, can completely change the next 90 days of your business completely change because you're ahead of the curve right yep. even to the point where you know I, I use data on a daily basis for selling and not even to people I'm speaking to so for example um, I speak with a prospect and we agree okay things are happening you know Dan we're going into you know Thanksgiving and I'm good call me in a month and through that conversation for example um, I'll pick up some key data points or some key strategic areas that he does, moves, happens to be in, works in, all that kind of stuff. And I'll actually over the next month, probably once a week, sometimes twice a week, depending on the article and depending on what it is, I'll actually send the customer articles mm -hmm. saying, hey, you know, we spoke about this. Here's some data points to reference that might help you with X, Y, Z that we talked about in our call. Mm -hmm. and, and nothing to do because... Again, my whole philosophy is our goal as salespeople, and, and like yourself, Dean, your goal mm -hmm. to collect data is to help your customers achieve their goals, mm -hmm. whether that be keeping their keeping their trucks moving at the highest profitability possible, right. staying ahead of all the, the changes and shifts and pivots in the industry, mm -hmm. retaining value, making sure they have long-term goal attainment. These mm -hmm. are all things that you focus on. Mm -hmm. All I'm looking to do is help the client achieve right. his goal. Right. In the interim, Right. My hope, my my desire is that the client sees me as that resource mm -hmm. that says, wow, you know, Dan's ahead of the curve here when it comes to that. Right. And right. everything we spoke about today is so bang on with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just yeah. awesome. There's a great example in today's uh, Packer. I read the Packer a lot, which is about the whole fruit and veggie industry. And they're talking mm -hmm. about, you know, if you think about seasonality, as, as it gets warmer in the Southern Hemisphere, more produce comes from the south, southern hemisphere to meet our winter demand because we don't mm -hmm. use a lot of produce over the winter. Well, where does it arrive? Well, if you go, if you sit on the, 
just off the 95 in Philadelphia, you can actually see the break bulk reefers coming in from Chile. And uh, you can spot them coming in, and you can almost guarantee that in two or three days of that ship docking, there's going to be about two, three hundred truckloads of produce to move. So if you sort of, if you, if you go back from, um, you know, you can see it visually, but I study, I study the flow of freight globally, so I can see what volume is going to hit what ports. Whether you know, we get a lot of freight from South America, we get a lot of bananas, of course, from Guatemala, comes in through Houston. Uh, got to look at the flow of freight and look at the timing and the seasonality. And that's why there's so much opportunity when you get down into the context of what's driving demand. You know, why are why is demand for asparagus and oranges up well over 200% year over year? Well, it's because vitamin C comes from oranges and people are being very health conscious during the pandemic. So they've gravitated towards produce that generates lots of benefits. So if you're in a market where there's citrus, like in Florida, that explains why you're going to see more volumes of probably fruit juices moving year over year compared to other years or um, out of Fresno in California, for example. Dean, you're a genius. Like, just that, that I, I'm, I'm telling you, no, I mean, that degree mm -hmm. of thought and knowledge and just, you know, strategy right. is in, insane. Oh, it goes yeah. into a rate, Dan. The rate, the rate is... Know. The rate is made up of so many complex factors, but I always think that on the day of, there's not a lot you can do, right? If you're if yeah. you're empty in a truck stop or you've got a load and you've got to find a truck, like negotiation is very important. You've got to be very good at knowing your market, but knowing weeks in advance what's happening is, I think, is probably one of the big advantages that, that shippers, brokers, and carriers can can uh, you know certainly use in their business because it tells you directionally where things are headed. Absolutely, and if you so, if I was talk. I was speaking with Nicole Glenn from Candor Expedite the other day, and um, you know, part of what she was saying is being an expedited company. Yeah, right. um, this data would be crucial mm -hmm. for her salespeople to identify. Hey, this is probably the next hot market that's going to need some expedited. Right? Can, do, can we position anything in there? And even as simple as, hey, Mister Customer, Mister Prospect, um, you know, the data is showing us. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a surge. So I think they, uh, the article I read this morning, pretty sure they said it was 928,000 more containers, TEUs, mm -hmm. TUEs, um, hit the port of California at this time this year than last year. Right. I mean, that's just, that, that volume is yeah. astronomical. Yeah. You know, it, as that happens, just know if you need any expedited help, I can help you. Right. right. And, you know, as a, I put myself in the customer's shoes and I say, okay, you've never no none of my suppliers have told me this is going to happen so now you start inquiring and, and a lot of people don't know in the end when it happens who's going to be the resource mm. it's going to be the one that came to you and said this is what's going to happen in the market yeah. i can remember when eld was hitting yeah. um i was speaking to a lot of automotive companies and i said listen things are going to happen for you when eld hits like you have to understand it and i remember one of them because like, no 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 we're not going to be affected by that. I said, you will. Mm -hmm. And when it happened and he was affected, he called me back. He said, you know what, Dan, you and an expedited company I deal with were the only two out of the hundreds of companies that we speak to weekly mm -hmm. that told us this is what was going to happen. Right. Only the two. And it, it got me yep. that image, credibility and brand yep. in that company right. to help them move their freight. Right. So important. And it starts with that outside of the box thinking. Any lineup you see, get out of that lineup and go the other way. I'm, I'm, oh. One of my first customers here in 2000 was a large trucking company that was uninsurable because that had multiple fatalities. And my, my expertise is human physiology and sleep scheduling and uh, you know teaching drivers how to sleep and designing 24 seven schedules. So um, they, 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 the insurance company had been losing money for years and they said, um, you think you're so clever, you go there and fix it. Well. Having run a few million miles as a driver and falling asleep for a living, which is what you do when you drive trucks, no one will admit it, but sleep is one of your biggest enemies. And uh, I, I sat down and the first place I went, because I said, we've got, we've got really tired drivers and multiple fatalities. And I said, okay, um, first place I want to go is operations and I want to sit on a splitter and listen to how you build loads. Because tired drivers are just a symptom of how you run your business, right? And they said, mm. well, that's not true. It's the drivers. I said, no, the drivers are just a symptom of a much deeper course. Well, it turned out 
they were putting 16 and a half hours work into a 12 hour schedule. And because they were paying drivers by the load, not by the hour, they were rushing and taking risks. Worse still, all of those accidents were in 10% of their customer base. So the recommendation was you have to jettison 10% of your revenue because it's so unsafe, it's killing your business from a load planning and accident risk perspective. Now, you want to talk about not coding, the sh you know, not sugarcoating a bit of pill? When I sat in the boardroom and said that, I, I, the, the looks could kill from the operations and safety manager. But I said, guys, I'm not going to sit here and, and try and spin the data in a way to make you feel good because the data is what it is. The data tells you exactly where your risk is and what's driving it, not the symptoms. Because I think people use data too much to focus on the symptoms. It's a lot, it's a lot like saying, well, we have too many hard break events. Well, I would say to you that a rapid deceleration event is an accident missed, not something to be punitive about and criticise the driver. In fact, you're, you, the, the safest drivers have two to three hard break events a week. It's, it's, it's not linear as in... The more you have, the worse you are. It's bathtub shaped. Too few and too many are bad, but there's a sweet spot for where you're missing stuff. And again, mm. if you look at the data, you would never know that your safest drivers have two to three hard break events. Uh, whereas most people look at data linearly, as in more is more is bad, less is less is better. So again, that's just a, uh, another example. It's probably a little bit tangential to the discussion about freight, but it just shows you how important data is in the transport industry. You know what? I think I think it's totally in line, Dean. Um, you know, some of the things that you shared at the TCA event last year was on um, uh, there was a bunch of things which related directly to accidents, which yeah. really blew my mind. And I can't remember the exact details. And I'm, that's horrible that I'm bringing it up. And I can't remember. I just remember it was game changing for me from the idea and strategy where there was, um, you know, when there was. Uh, I can tell you sorry. what it was. It, it was um, one of the strongest risk factors of a driver having an accident or quitting is the days until his or her DOT physical. Yes, that was it. That was something so really and it was bang. Yeah. Mm. And I chewed it because it gets to the psychology and the distraction and the stress. Because what drivers are afraid about these days is the fact that they might lose their DOT license uh, or their medical card and then they can't generate an income. And because the DOT physical is very different these days. In 2004, it was, do you snore, yes or no? Now it's blood pressure, sugar levels, um, they do all sorts of tests on you. Um, if you've got blood pressure, your diastolic's over 90, you're on a one-year card. Um, sometimes they force you to go for a sleep study, which drivers sometimes have to pay for. So there's this whole fear about livelihood, and it starts about nine months out from when your DOT physical's due because you know you've stopped your meds and you're putting on weight, and you know your sleep is terrible, and because you're waking up with a headache and you can't remember stuff and you feel depressed. So, so this, this is what goes on with drivers. And as the closer they get to this DOT physical, the more stressed they become. Now, there's no data point that captures the stress. It's not a field in a database. But mm -hmm. when you look at every driver that's ever had an accident or ever quit and how many days it was from their accident to the date of the DOT physical or their licence renewal date or the number of stops per load, you actually start to find what drives your risk and it's always counterintuitive. And, and that's why data is so powerful because it tells you objectively what's driving your business as opposed to what you think and feel, which again comes back to how we started, which is the whole human bias element. Dean, un unbelievable, unbelievable. I, I can't thank you enough for this time. I can't thank you enough for your knowledge. Um, I know for a fact everyone who actually listened and, right. and took notes is going to benefit huge from this. And I'm, I am huge. Going, I'm going to call you because I'm thinking about putting an expedited box on the back of my Peterbilt that can handle minus 100 degree vaccines because I think that's a niche that you can actually get. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. If you get a vacutainer, put the vacutainer on, build a box around the vacutainer, plug the vacutainer into the power for your actual uh, truck. Right. Um, now you have a battery backup plus plus, right? right. So you're, um, you know, I mean, I don't know how much a vacutainer is. I know um, I was big in pharmaceuticals before I left the corporate industry and um, 
we hauled vacuum containers everywhere. We'd go to, you know, LAX or we'd go to um, Kennedy wow. and we would pick up vacuum containers that had like a, I think it was a, some of them had a 36, some had a 27 hour battery life. Wow. And the trailer would have to be like minus 10, but then the vacuum container was minus 15. And wow. it, and it, the, the, the reefer was actually just a backup in case the vacuum container wow. failed. Yeah. Um, and it was, I mean, yeah, you want to talk sleepless nights, you're kind of like, you got three hours left on that on that thing because it had to fly from where it was to the, and you know you got four hours left and where are you right now and it, oh yeah you're, you're you're very sleepless nights but you know what you want to talk a niche um i've been saying since this happened mm -hmm. guys the logistics mm -hmm. of a vaccine mm -hmm. is going to be the largest logistical plan yep. and execution in history yeah and you watch yep the amount of people yeah. Yeah. that get noticed right. when they do things right. And, right. and, you know, I had a conversation with, with a, uh, a student yesterday and we were talking about industries, right? And he was saying, you know, I, I want to be known in an industry. And I said, okay, I said, and I, and I gave him an example of a company I dealt with in Scarborough, Ontario, that shipped CD cases and DVD cases, right? So in the end, they were shipping pretty much sailboat fuel the entire everywhere they went mm -hmm. and i can remember because in the asset based company i worked for we were doing 25 30 loads a day mm -hmm. and then it would go to then one week it went to, to you know from 30 went to 25 and the next day it was 15 the next day it was 10 next day it was five and at, on friday we got none mm -hmm. so i called the traffic manager and i said look I, I need a meeting like I, I thought this was kind of a blip for a day but it seems to be a downward trend can, can we talk about it? he says yeah sure come on in so we went i went and sat down with him and, and you know, talking about how data um, gets you to think differently, Dean. Um, when I sat down, I said, George, you know, like, I don't, I don't understand this. We, you know, we go, he goes, Dan, I, I got somebody that's $15 cheaper in order. And my first response was, or my first reaction, sorry, it wasn't even a response. I go, are you kidding me? Like, we're doing, we're doing, giving you team service for single rates. We're, because we were doing Dell computer and stuff coming home. Right. And. So we were able to afford to do that because of the round trip rate, the mile, the, the rate per mile was still killer because it was all computers, electronics. We were all high value product coming into Canada. And he says, Dan, you got to think of it like this. I ship pretty close to, you know, 100, 150,000 orders a year. Hmm. Like when we're talking all of our lanes, you handle one lane. Mm -hmm at 30 trucks a day. He yeah. goes, I am the largest supplier of MGM and Nintendo, mm -hmm. PlayStation, like all of the companies, everything ships in these discs back then, right? Mm -hmm. And he's like, you know, you gotta understand, I, $10, $15 a shipment at that many shipments, he goes, you do the math. Mm -hmm. That's direct profit to my bottom line. Mm -hmm. He goes, I'm not pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. If I can get a cheap rate, I expect people to pick up and deliver on time. Mm -hmm. I expect that. But if I can get a cheap rate, I have to go with it because I'm not doing my business a service by not doing it. And I shared that story with the salesperson. I said, now you look at pharmaceuticals, mm. you look at the vaccine, perfect example. Um, you need to get it there for it to be there in a safe manner. It's for human consumption. It needs to be transported in a specific way. You need to get it there. Mm -hmm. That's not dollar store price. That's mm -hmm. going to come with some kind of premium. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody's four thousand dollars higher and they need to be used, I'm pretty sure they will be used for a short period of time when it's needed. Mm -hmm. um, but there's some some real long term, very profitable relationships to be made yep. in this in this distribution of the vaccine. Yep. Um, whether it be from a government perspective, from a pharmaceutical, from a from a drug manufacturer perspective, um, there's something to be said from publicity, everything for those that do it right. Exactly. And those that are, that are, that understand the logistical, I mm -hmm. mean, you know, how many billions right. of vaccine, you know, global, I mean, logistically right. crazy. Yeah. Insane. Well, I mean, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I'm just going to say fascinating discussion. We could probably talk all day, but Oh, I know, I know, I know. Let's close it there, my friend. Dean, I, I thank you so much for being yeah. here. I, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Every time we speak, you just 
opened my mind to more and more. And, and you know what, you talk about being a sponge, my friend, I'm a sponge every time you speak. I'm, I'm, I'm hanging on every word, my friend, and I really appreciate your time. And you know what, for all of you watching and listening, if you've gotten this far, you've taken huge value out of this, make sure you go register for the High Performance Logistics Sales Summit because Dean's gonna be there. We've got a whole bunch of other industry experts that are gonna be there. And this is just the tip of the iceberg about what we're gonna be talking about and how we're gonna be moving through sales cycles, sequencing, data, and you know what, Dean? Data is the new oil, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to it. Thank you, Dan.